right, uh, it's 2.01, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining today's webinar, uh, Redefining Non-Metro. Uh, what does the OMB's proposed change, changes to the metropolitan definition mean for rural America? Uh, my name is Dan Stern. I'm the Communications and Outreach Manager at the Housing Assistance Council, and I'll be the host for today's webinar. Um, all the participants are in listen-only mode, which means your line is muted. However, we do want to hear from you and are interested in uh, getting your feedback. To submit a comment or a question, you can use the chat function, which should appear in the menu bar at the top of your screen. It looks like a little chat bubble. Uh, so go ahead and type in your questions, and we'll be monitoring that as the presentation goes along and try to get to as many as we can by the end of the presentation. Uh, as you may have seen from a pop-up, today's webinar is being recorded. The, the recording and presentation will be available on HACS website uh, within the next couple of days after the presentation. We will also be emailing it out to everyone who attends. Uh, so HACS website is www.ruralhome.org. So, if you're not familiar with us, uh, the Housing Assistance Council, or HACC as we often go by, is a national nonprofit that's focused on, um, or we, that builds homes and communities in rural areas. Uh, we've had a, we've been around for 50 years, or right about, it's our 50th and uh, birthday, I guess you would say this year. And we, uh, so we were founded in 1971, for those of you who are good at math. Uh, we, the way we build affordable homes is through financial products like loans and um, certain grant opportunities. We also have, uh, we offer technical assistance and training, um, trainings like today's webinar. Uh, we also have um, sort of uh, a lot, of, we produce a lot of research around a rural housing and rural issues and if you're not a subscriber to our Hack News uh, newsletter and our other information products, you want to be. You can find all that information at our website, as I said earlier, ruralhome.org. And uh, I'm going to introduce you to our presenter for today. Um, a lot of you are probably familiar with him, but this is Lance George. He's our Director of Research and Information at the Housing Assistance Council. And I am going to turn the presentation over to Lance now. Thank you all for joining us. Hi, everyone. I'm Lance George with the Housing Assistance Council. Thank you for joining us today for this discussion on the Office of Management Budget's changes to their metropolitan areas definition. Um, it's good to see everyone. I'll be the first to admit that I'm a little tired of this forum or medium. Um, I look forward to the day when we can all kind of meet in person and see one another again. But thank you for your participation and attention. Um, it was stated earlier that the Housing Assistance Council is a national nonprofit that supports affordable housing efforts in rural areas of the United States, and we do that through an array of activities. One of those is to help inform strategies, solutions, and policies. Oftentimes, it's to help, or I think most importantly, to inform at the local community-based level, to inform rural communities what policies and strategies and issues mean for their community, but also to help inform the larger debate. And that's what we'll try today to do today. We really look forward to your um, participation in your discussion on this issue because it'll help inform, I think, our processes going forward and the larger debate. Thank you. We're primarily looking forward to your insights and discussion on this issue today, but to help inform that discussion, we prepared some really basic background information with four major components. The first of which is, what are OMB's metropolitan areas and what are the proposed changes to really primer on the, on the concept? The second is, how have OMB's metropolitan areas intersected with rural communities traditionally? Third, we just really briefly look at um, what are some descriptive, what are the potential for some descriptive statistical changes in the areas? What would this mean? And the fourth is, what are the implications for this change programmatically and practically on the communities you serve and the work that you do? We'll start with a really basic overview of the OMB's metropolitan area concept and what are some of the proposed changes to that long-term concept? I could recite a really technical definition, 
But at its essence, OMB's metropolitan area is really in, is a measure of economic connection or connectivity to a core urban area. And that urban area has traditionally been defined as a that one with a population of 50,000 or more, the kind of core area. And then it also encapsulates surrounding communities that have a social economic connection with that core urban area, primarily through commuting to work. I um, mean, then finally, a fourth major component is that it's county based. Uh, so it includes counties as its primary unit of geography, although it aggregates up to a combined metropolitan area. It's a little more complicated than that, and I can elaborate more in the discussion, but I'll leave it at those four major areas. And that it is uh, unique in, in the concept in the area that it is a connection to a core urban area. Recently, the Office of Management and Budget proposed some changes to its metropolitan area standards. And this is really not that uncommon. Often in conjunction with the decennial census, they've presented changes. And many of those are traditionally tweaks or relatively innocuous or minor to help continually improve the product in this designation. But in this iteration, there was one more substantial change than what we typically see. And that is that the, would basically change the core threshold of what defines the core urban area. And it, it doubles the threshold, it increases it from 50,000 to 100,000. So now in the proposed change, um, to qualify as a metropolitan area, you'd have to have a core urban area of 100,000 or more. And that's a relatively substantial change to this designation. To help put the proposed changes in perspective, here's a really brief timeline of OMB's metropolitan area definitions over the long term and the very near term. So this concept was first developed in the late 1940s and was first really implemented in the 1950 census or after the 1950 census and changed every 10 years with the, in conjunction with the decennial census. Those were the major changes from the 1950s up until present day. Um, again, most of them, the major changes came every 10 years and they were incorporated oftentimes two to three years after the release of the decennial census. I know in 2000, the changes weren't incorporated till 2003. And similarly, in the 2010 census, they came around 2013. The most recent set of standards there are minor changes from year to year or from 2019. So on January 19, 2021, OMB su submitted the proposed changes that we're discussing today. And those and comments on those changes are due on March 19, 2021. And consistent with past years, the proposed changes are, are implemented or proposed to be implemented in 2023. To present an illustration of that OMB timeline, here's a map of the original metropolitan areas in 1950, shaded in green. And here are OMB metropolitan areas in 1960, 1970, 1980, 1990, 2000, 2010, and the most recent designation in 2019, which has relatively minor changes from the 2013 designation. And we'll discuss this in more detail in a few minutes, but the areas shaded in blue on this map are communities that are estimated to lose their metropolitan area status as a result of the proposed changes. Again, this is just an estimate. We don't have a definitive list yet, but these are the estimates based on um, the threshold populations in 2010. So you probably noticed in looking at those maps that they progressively got more green as the years went on. In essence, there were just many more metropolitan areas and more metropolitan territory and population added over the last 70 years. Um, and this is another way to illustrate that just from the inverse, looking at I think what uh, the dynamic that many of us on this um, discussion are interested in outside metropolitan areas. So in 1950, around 45% of the population lived outside of a metropolitan area. But you'll notice this kind of steady trend line moving down the proportion of the population to 2019, where 
it's estimated that about 14.1 percent of the nation's population live outside of metropolitan area. So a pretty standard um, and dramatic decline in the outside metropolitan population and just a continued trend towards urbanization and suburbanization in the United States over that period of time, at least measured by this indicator. And then an estimate of the proposed change. So if those new thresholds were implemented, it would increase the outside metropolitan population, an estimate up to around 19 or 20 percent. Again, that is an estimate, but indicated in the line but blue in 2023, you would see an increase in the outside metropolitan area designation simply because you would take away so many metropolitan areas. Before we get into a discussion of the changes, the proposed changes to the OMB definition areas, I thought it might be instructive or helpful to briefly look at how this designation has intersected with rural communities and rural areas over the long term um, and currently. So I will just qualify my comments here that at least from my perspective, there is no perfect definition of rural. Um, some of you may remember um, the, the famous demographer from the Economic Research Service, Calvin Beale. And I often say, if Calvin didn't find the perfect definition of rural, it simply doesn't exist. It kinda, I think he had a career, the Holy Grail, looking for that. Um, I would be interested to see what Calvin thinks of this current circumstance. But I really do think there are pros and cons to every definition. Um, but I think increasingly, um, metropolitan, I have an, a, a kind of an equation here that says outside metropolitan area does not equal rural. Um, and I would say outside metro is, and I would qualify this, is increasingly a bad proxy for rural areas. And the pros and cons, and I'll provide a few um, examples where the OMB designation has some helpful elements. But in many respects, I, I, I think it's my consensus and a lot of my colleagues' consensus that it is increasingly not a good proxy for rural areas. It's becoming more outdated and outmoded. And just one comment on semantics. I know I think it's even the title of our presentation. Um, and you'll often hear the term non-metropolitan or non-metro colloquially, but technically that is an obsolete term. It was, uh, these communities were referred to as non-metropolitan prior to the 2013 designation, but that was changed into the 2013 designation and replaced by the term outside metropolitan core based statistical area, which is a mouthful. So um, I know I still use the term non-metropolitan and non-metro from time to time, but we primarily try to adhere to the outside metro vernacular. I know this is going to sound like an airing of grievances, but there are three or four structural or systemic elements of the OMB classification that are just simply problematic in the rural context. And the first of which is what we would classify as the either or problem. Um, and this is not exclusive to OMB. Like many classifications, it is dichotomous, meaning there are only really two indicators. Um, for example, metropolitan or outside metropolitan, or census-defined urban or census-defined rural. Or another example is USDA's uh, eligible area definition for its housing programs, either you're eligible or you're not. And in reality, this dichotomous component really ignores a fundamental reality of residential patterns in the United States. So to put a finer point on this, approximately half of all Americans live in a suburban community. But in this binary context, that suburban population invariably gets lumped with in, into either urban or rural or metro or outside metro populations. And it d distorts and often distorts or dilutes that dynamic um, in, that, in that context. Um, just to show, give you an, a geographic example, in addition to the population standard, the map to the left, all those areas indicated in yellow or orange, light orange, are suburban or ex-urban communities classified by the Housing Assistance Council. The OMB designation also suffers from the residual problem in that it's a very urban centric classification. So it goes into great detail about how an, a metropolitan area is defined. 
but if you are not in that metropolitan area, there is no definition. You're just the other than. You're the residual. You're outside of that. So it pro provides no discussion or analysis of rural residential patterns. It's simply based on the OMB metropolitan area. And if you don't meet that classification, you really are just um, outside of that. Simply stated, that's what, you, that's what those communities are. There's no designation or no analysis for that particular dynamic. It's just outside other than or the residual. The OMB classification increasingly has structural concerns, and I think this is a, a problem or concern regardless of whether it's inside metropolitan or outside metropolitan. So the OMB classification has traditionally relied on two major indicators, one of which is just basic population counts and other commuting patterns. But increasingly, many modern definitions of residential or residential pattern rely on population density or housing density. And I think um, some of that is just because we have more computing capacity. They have the ability to actually do this now. But in some respects, this dynamic or this paradigm might be coming increasingly outmoded or outdated. To provide a potential illustration of that structural problem, here's a map. And all of the areas outlined are the metropolitan areas that we've previously seen in the maps that were green. And in this shade, in this map, there's a different shade of green where we believe at the Housing Assistance Council, all of those areas shaded in green, even though they are metropolitan areas um, where they have an, an outline, in those shaded in green are actually what we would classify as rural or small town territory. So you see, again, that incongruity between the rural and small town population. I think this is probably a function, increasingly a function of um, that structural problem on the unit of analysis. So this is the end of the airing of grievances for outside metropolitan areas, but I do think there is another, in, and again, increasing concern, what we call the geography problem, particularly as it relates to rural areas. So the, as I noted before, the OMB's primary unit of analysis is a classification at the county level. Um, while counties definitely have advantages, most people understand where they live and they're often associated with in social, economic, and political terms, the county is not optimal in many designations, and that's because it just varies so much across the United States, um, particularly in the western United States where you have very large counties, and I'll provide an example of that. Um, and I think this also parlays just simply into that um, discussion where in the past, we, we used the county, we didn't have the computing capacity or the ability to do sub-county analysis, and now we simply do. This is an example of the geography problem. It's uh, with OMB metropolitan areas. It's often used, and I should probably find something a little more creative, but I will resort to it as well. So San Bernardino County in California is one of the larger counties in the United States, uh, very large territories combined here with Riverside County. Um, but simply stated, this county probably has, you know, more land mass than several northeastern states combined. Um, but yet in this area, it's some of the more remote and forbidding territory, the Mojave Desert. So if you learn one thing from today's presentation, it's that the Mojave Desert is metropolitan. But there, you'll notice there are other large counties in the West that kind of suffer this problem where you have relatively large territory. Um, and some of that is very rural territory, but it's encapsulated into the metropolitan area because of the county level designation. There's another really good example in Minnesota, St. Louis County, which includes Duluth at the very bottom tip, but it goes all the way up to the Canadian border, a very large county. And again, some of the more remote kind of um, Canadian Northwoods and Minnesota Northwoods, an another example of this issue. So. It really illustrates the variation in the county sizes and another problematic issue with metropolitan areas. We discussed the progression and some of the structural elements of OMB's metropolitan area classifications. So now we'll turn to 
some of the proposed modifications and that how that might alter the composition of outside metropolitan area communities. Obviously, this is going to vary from market to market, but we did provide a few estimates for selected social, economic, and housing indicators to determine what impact um, the changes may have on, again, the composition of those communities. Uh, it's important to stress that these are simply estimates and we wouldn't know until we got the exact census numbers. So we've alluded to this dynamic of residents uh, in this discussion before, um, noting that in some metropolitan areas you would have both sub urban, suburban, and rural and small town territory in some of those communities we highlighted a map before. And typically that dynamic goes one way where in, in, in metropolitan communities, you can have all three of those dynamics, but outside metropolitan communities are, are basically rural and small town communities as illustrated here. So under HACS definition, where we try to classify uh, identify urban, suburban, and rural and small town communities. Currently, the, we, there are no suburban or exurban communities outside of metropolitan areas. But when you include the new designations, um, about 74% of the population in those estimated areas that would now revert back to met, outside metropolitan areas are suburban and exurban population. About 9% is urban about 20% is rural and small town. So that would be a dramatic change. Usually it goes the other way, but this is an indication where you would start to absorb suburban and urban population within outside metropolitan areas. In terms of absolute population, around 14% of the U.S. population currently live outside of metropolitan areas and about 85% live in metropolitan areas. But under the new designation, that would increase to about 19.5% of the population living outside of metropolitan areas. Um, generally speaking, I think the 14% of the population was a relatively low estimate of if it were a proxy for rural communities. But at the same time, I don't know if the new designation is adequately capturing a proxy for rural and small town population, as previously noted. The communities estimated to change their metropolitan status are slightly more racially and ethnically diverse than current outside metropolitan communities. As an example, about 78% of the population in current outside metropolitan areas are white and not Hispanic, and that declines slightly in the new proposed areas to about 74, 75%. And for example, African American population would increase from 8% currently to about 10%, and likewise for Hispanics, the Hispanic population um, would increase to about 10% in the, in the new selected counties. Uh, income levels are slightly higher in the new proposed outside metropolitan areas as opposed to the current metropolitan areas. Um, as an indicator, the median household income currently in outside metropolitan areas is roughly at $50,000 dollars per year per household, um, somewhere around $49,000. Um, in the new counties, the identified counties that uh, could change in metropolitan status, the median income in those counties is somewhere in the neighborhood of $53,000 or $54,000 annually. And that is, both of those are substantially lower than the national U.S. median income of $68,000 or somewhere above $68,000. So income levels would be a little higher in the communities poised for change. I'm having a little technical difficulty getting this graph to display, but we also looked at one particular housing indicator, which I think is one of the more salient issues is just housing affordability. And there was, um, you know, the, there are slightly more affordability challenges in the communities that are poised for, for, for change or for it to change in metropolitan status. So the level of housing cost burdened homes or units in those communities was somewhere in the neighborhood of 32% of the occupied housing stock. And in the current OMB metropolitan areas, it's roughly 29.2%. So not a major change. Both of those communities have housing affordability challenges. 
um, that are not unsubstantial, but probably not at the level of some higher level um, uh, metropolitan areas as well. I am somewhat confident that many of you joining us today are particularly interested in this element of the discussion, which looks at um, the programmatic implications of how this change might impact your work and the services you provide to your communities and your stakeholders. I really hate to disappoint you, but this is largely where we are at with this dynamic. So previously in this discussion, I said I wouldn't recite the technical language from the proposed rule, but in this instance, I will. So this comes directly from the proposed change. OMB establishes and maintains these areas solely for statistical purposes. In reviewing and revising these areas, OMB does not take into account or attempt to anticipate any public or private sector non-statistical uses that may be made of the delineations. These areas are not designated to serve as a general purpose geographic framework applicable for non-statistical activities or for use in program funding formula. So I rem remember reading this passage or something very similar to it when I first became engaged in this in the early 2000s in the 2003 um, OMB designations and thinking that's odd. Um, and I'll have to say we noted earlier in this discussion of some of the structural challenges or some of the structural problems with the OMB designated metropolitan areas. What well, I have to say, this is probably the largest of those challenges. Simply stated, this position by OMB just rely, belies reality. Um, there are hundreds of federally, federally funded programs that administer billions of dollars of aid that are often statutorily tied to this designation. Yet there is no effort or due diligence for OMB to take responsibility for this element of their classification. Simply stated, it's very difficult to estimate the proposed changes um, programmatically. So while we can't provide any detailed analysis of the programmatic impacts, here are a few examples of a several programs, selected programs, that could or could not, that's the operative word, be substantially impacted by these changes in OMB metropolitan areas. Um, and the first of which that comes to mind is HUD's Community Development Block Grant Funds, um, where one could envision, and we've tried to read the, the statute and the regulations, and it is somewhat unclear, somewhat contradictory, but potentially, um, you know, there are, uh, entitlement communities are tied to metropolitan areas. And if a community lost its metropolitan area status, then conceivably it could also lose its entitlement status and therefore go into the competitive pool with other non-entitlement communities, which could have a major implications for not only that community, but the larger competitive pool. That's just one example. At another level, um, area median incomes, which are often very important for administering many of the resources and programs that you work with, are frequently tied to metropolitan areas. And one could envision if a community lost its uh, metropolitan area status, that it's no longer tied to a larger, potentially a larger metropolitan area and would have radically, you know, have a, a radical change in its area median incomes almost overnight. I neglected to mention in this discussion that one of the positive attributes often associated with OMB metropolitan areas is it's relatively simple and easy to understand and incorporate. I cannot say the same for USDA's Rural Housing Service Eligible Areas definition. This is probably one of the more complicated definitions of rural or um, eligibility that I've ever seen. However, interestingly enough, within that, it actually uses USDA definition uses OMB metropolitan areas, what I would classify as an adjustment factor. So I won't go into detail, but there could be downstream ramifications or residual ramifications from the change in the OMB metropolitan area on USDA eligible service areas. Again, this is the map, those counties shaded in blue would be communities that potentially would lose their OMB metropolitan 
status and revert back to outside metropolitan areas. And one could envision the changes in the USDA provision of both single uh, single family direct and guaranteed uh, mortgage originations in these communities. It's hard to estimate, but there would definitely be likely be impact in these communities because of that. Again, at another level, uh, HUD's fair market rents are often pegged to a metropolitan or a geographic area that could um, have significant changes on the, the fair market rents. It's again, very difficult to, to establish, but one could imagine that there could be potential ramifications for the changes in fair market rents, particularly those communities that would lose their metropolitan status. And finally, uh, from yet another perspective, the OMB metropolitan area definition has been relatively stable and constant over the last 70 years, and that has allowed researchers and analysts to conduct a large scale kind of longitudinal analysis over a long period of time. I'm not as sympathetic towards this particular issue, but I'm also a researcher and it has value. Again, we at the Housing Assistance Council have uh, increasingly try not to use OMB metropolitan areas for statistical purposes for many of the reasons we identified earlier in this discussion that it's simply not that good. But in many instances, we are at the mercy of these data because there are no other data. A good example is the COVID-19 analysis is really only done at the metropolitan area. Similarly, some of the impacts of COVID-19, we can only look at unemployment rates at from a OMB metropolitan area. So again, very difficult to, to determine, but undoubtedly, if you were to change, radically alter the definition or the classifications as much as that are proposed, this would definitely alter research and longitudinal analysis purposes. I did not purposefully include this photograph with a stop sign for this particular slide, but it might be a good metaphor or a good indication on how we do proceed or how the OMB proceeds. We noted several examples of structural challenges of this classification and definition, particularly as they relate to rural communities or outside metropolitan areas. Um, it seems as if OMB had a good opportunity here during this process to address some of those. And really what we see is um, potentially even newer, greater concerns with this particular um, designation. So, Comments on this issue are due to OMB by March 19th, and you can find a link to submit your comments below on this slide. Um, the Housing Assistance Council will post this presentation and additional information such as interactive maps and the list of potential communities that may lose their OMB status. You can also get more information at HAC's website, www.ruralhome.org. I uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, we look forward to the discussion and garnering your insights and expertise and perspective on this important process and how we should move forward. So thank you very much. I'm going to once again include the information on how to submit the comments. All right, thank you, Lance for that presentation. Um, seeing a lot of activity in the chat, so I'm pulling up some of these questions. Uh, do you have any comments right after the fact, just to? Uh, no, I, I do, Dan, can you hear me? Yes. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank everybody again for joining us. Um, we're gonna get to a couple of questions. I saw a few popping up in the chat, but again, we really appreciate everyone's participation and attending today. This is a really important issue. It's relatively new and complicated, as you can see. Um, and we at the Housing Assistance Council really value your input and your insights to help inform um, our comments on this, but also to help to inform the entire community. So we tried to provide a little bit of background information, but we really value and look, uh, look towards your comments to help inform this process as well. Um, and I would also just reiterate and reinforce that comments are due um, we, I think there's a lot of power in the regulatory comment system, so I think we need to hear from everyone. Comments are due, or we we'll try to, um, about 10 days from now, March 19th, 2021, 
um, and we will uh, provide additional information on how to submit your comments or upload your comments. And hopefully the Housing Assistance Council will have more information, but we really wanted your input before we finalize some of our comments or our input on this issue. So I think I'll open it up to questions. I did see a couple that I'll probably just jump into, Dan, and I think I really appreciate the community. That's one of the values of this medium, I have to say. Sometimes I don't have to answer the questions because some in the community were already answering those questions. There was a really good question about uh, micropolitan areas, and this is this is important. It is it was a new designation added to the OMB metropolitan area uh, standards around 2003. Um, and it incorporates primarily communities um, below the metropolitan area threshold, the traditional metropolitan area threshold, but with a population of urban population from 10,000 to 49,999. Uh, the important thing here and why we didn't talk about it that much is it's relatively new. I would welcome conversation on this. It's not widely used in my experience. It's often used more for academic purposes. Um, it's not as widely used as the delineation between outside metropolitan, the traditional and metropolitan. But um, I don't think that to the best of my understanding, and I could be corrected on this, within the proposed changes, that the OMB micropolitan areas are slated for any change. And that's why we also didn't include it. So it's a relatively new concept and in my experience, not widely used. So we wanted to primarily focus on where the where most of the changes were in this discussion. I also okay. saw Dan and I'll just react to one other. I'm sure I missed them, but I was trying to scan the chat um, on the map. So the Housing Assistance Council did produce some maps, as you can see. There is a map that's attached to the comments that the Federal Register presented, um, and, and that's an, it's an appendix of what they also estimated. Although we have, in some of our analysis, we have some questions on how that was calculated. We could not entirely replicate that. Um, we got very close, but there were a few communities that we just simply couldn't replicate in our analyses. And I think it's important to note that all many of these presentations of the data were based on estimates and you wouldn't know the exact number or the exact figure until the release of the 2020 decennial census. So it's very close. And there's also a little bit of confusion um, within the OMBs. And it, this is minor, this gets into more geography speak, whether it was urban area or urbanized area. So um, we will present that map, but you can also find maybe a more slightly more official map uh, connected to the OMB rule that will also will also submit or will also post as well. So um, I hope that helps answer that particular question. But there's somewhere in the neighborhood of 250 counties that potentially, again, that's the operative word, potentially could lose their metropolitan area designation if these standards were enacted. OK, thank you for that, Lance. Uh, there's a few questions out there, a few along the lines of uh, this is asking you to break out your crystal ball. But how likely do you think this is to be enacted? These the definition change, considering there's a new director of OMB and other things like that. Um, I'll be candid. I don't know if I have insights on that particular process. I mean, it has tip traditionally it's gone through this process. This was nothing new. We all would always get these proposed changes are right around the decennial census, but there were never really of this magnitude or this gravity, right? That is a pretty substantial change when you're doubling the, the population threshold for a metropolitan area, urban area or urban core status for a metropolitan area. So I'll be I'll be honest, I don't know if I have a crystal ball. We've been in, in conversations with other colleagues and, and, and other experts around around this issue. Um, it has traditionally proceeded, but we hope that your comments and your in input can help influence this decision candidly. And along those lines, uh, Joshua Stewart asks, uh, if OMB specifically denies programmatic slash uh, funding impacts is something they will take into account when weighing comments, how can we best be persuasive or impactful with our comments? Um, this, uh, I, I think this is a, a really robust discussion from um, an, an August group, I would say, so we really appreciate that. Um, we are still formulating our comments, but I think it is um, one of the major themes that's coming out of this is, and I would just point back to that stop sign, that OMB probably needs to stop. 
and revisit this entire issue, notably around some of the systemic issues that rural communities have been all long overlooked in this designation even before the changes. So there just needs to be more attention and candidly just an acknowledgement that this even though it states that they deny kind of any plausibility or there's uh, of, of impacting larger issues outside of that statistical definition, it does. There's no doubt that you can document it's based in statute. So um, I would hope that um, they would listen to some of the comments or the um, positions from, from community members and how this might impact your actual community. But it's very difficult to estimate that as well. And uh, you mentioned that county is not necessarily a good measure to identify rural communities. Um, what level of geography do you think we should focus on? I would I would go back and almost contradict myself, Dan, and say that county is not optimum, um, and but there is no probably perfect designation. In many respects, many of you know, and I often say this question, um, uh, you probably everyone on the call knows what county they live in. But I would challenge almost anyone to tell me what you know the 11 digit number census tract that they live in. So I think that's a challenge, but increasingly we at the Housing Assistance Council use census tracts because it provides a more granular um, level of analysis. So it has its pros and cons as well. Like there's, you know, there are only around 3000 counties. And again, many people are much more familiar with that unit of analysis or that unit of geography because of their political, social and economic lives. There are over 72,000, and with the new decennial census, there'll be more than 84,000 census tracts. So it's a little more unwieldy, um, and I noted this before, at least from the statistical purposes, we didn't even at the Housing Assistance Council probably have the computing capacity to do some of this work uh, eight or 10 years ago, but now we do. Um, and that's helped inform our work where we increasingly move to uh, uh, the census tract as the unit of analysis, but you can very easily aggregate back up to a certain community. Um, but there's no perfect definition there either. I'm often that one hand, other hand. Um, OK, uh, are there any other changes um, beyond the urban area threshold that, that were presented in the recommendations? So there are a few additional changes that were presented, and those would be more along the line what I mentioned before. Uh, in this process, every 10 or 12 years, you would get some almost around the edges changes that would be incremental improvements. One of those, uh, I think there are, there are several of them. Some of them, I, I believe, are positive to have uh, typically instead of larger increments where you update the status, they would, be, they would become um, in shorter frequency, so you'd have more updates that would be more up to date. Um, they discontinued, uh, there was a special designation for northeastern communities, and they proposed to discontinue that, that unit of analysis. Um, and I think there was a more robust effort at uh, help trying to define U.S. territories with, with OMB status. So not all territories, I think, have this designation, and there were some suggestions around that. And also to continually rely on the American Community Survey in this process, but they also state generally in that process um, about, uh, you know, working towards improvement. So we think that's a positive as well, but what's taking up all the oxygen in the room is this threshold increase to, um, that doubles the threshold increase. And the rationale for that was simply that well, population has doubled since this was first enacted, but that is a pretty blunt force instrument way to, to re remedy or rectify that particular issue, I would say. All right. Uh, Steve Hirsch also points out that uh, the prior change took several years uh, to implement, and this is offering a 60 day window. So that's just a uh, interesting uh, change to note. Um, it looks like we don't have any more questions in the chat directly. Uh, if you'd like, we can open up the lines. I can, uh, we have a hand raised and we can allow some people to ask questions verbally, if that works. Um, looks like uh, Bonnie Nichols, uh, has her hand raised. Uh, I've set it to allow you to unmute, so go ahead.
And if anybody does want to ask a question, you can go ahead and uh, hit the raise your hand button. It's one of the uh, emotions that's listed at the top of the screen. Uh, and we'll get you in here. Um, we, in lieu of that, we did get a question in chat. Are there any indications that the change in classification would be accompanied with additional funding and or resources for rural areas? I, I would. <laughs> I, I think I could, uh, I don't know, this gets into the crystal ball, Dan. I would say, yeah, I would I would speculate. But at the same time, I do think this is, if, it, if some of these changes are enacted, at the end of the day, I think many programs or many uh, administrations that, that administer these funds can look back at that OMB designation and say, this is for statistical purposes only, and that we can make modifications to some of our programmatic delineations under this relatively radical change. I would hope that that would be considered by agencies and efforts that um, command those resources at the very least. Okay, well, I am not seeing any additional questions. Um, so, uh, Lance, do you have any uh, final thoughts for anyone? Oh, wait, no, Tom Collishaw getting in there. Uh, how do you think these regulations will line up with the 2020 census? So, I, uh, I, Tom, I can't speak directly to that, but I think oftentimes they are, using my rural colloquialisms, part and parcel of the decennial census. So this process really changes every 10 years. Um, and it will it will uh, align in conjunction with the 2020 census. Interestingly enough, I would say I'll make one comment since we have a couple of minutes here. When you look at this statistically, kind of like the data geeks that we are, you see some anomalies show up in rural communities um, within this analysis. Many of these communities that are potentially slated to lose their uh, lose their metropolitan status, not all of them, but several of them pop up. They are university towns. Um, that are probably influenced by uh, students that are in those communities. And when Tom mentioned the 2020 census, one of the major challenges with getting the 2020 census numbers is that most college students have not been on campus for a year. And it's been really hard to document and enumerate that population. And that could, you know, even further impact this particular issue because you, you do note um, oftentimes we see this in rural analysis where you see these minor anomalies really in cost burden and some other social and economic elements. And you look and you say, how is that little island there? What's going on? And oftentimes it's a college town. Um, and I think this in this instance related to the 2020 census, I know that's somewhat of a non sequitur, um, Tom, but I would say college towns could be more impacted than others purely from a, just looking at the map and making some some off the cuff projections. Okay, well, if there are no further questions, um, I think we can let you guys go a little bit early. Um, uh, so first of all, I'd like to thank Lance for that presentation and all of you for bearing with us through some technical difficulties early on. Um, and just as a reminder, uh, the recording of this webinar and the presentation will be available on our website, which is www.ruralhome.org uh, later on this week. And uh, once again, I'd like to thank you all for joining us. And Dan, could I add, just add oh, one, sure, thing? Please. one more plea? Again, thank you all. I add to, to Dan's thanks. Thanks to the hack team for putting this together. But um, a couple of points just to reiterate the importance of being heard here. You, we really would ask that you're able, you're able to, if possible, to weigh in. We'll try to facilitate that if we can. But that is extremely important. This has been a relatively short process. As you know, it's only 60 days. Um, and this is a lot of information to digest and consume, but it is, it could have relatively substantial ramifications for rural communities. So one, thank you so much for your participation and your interest. 
but you are the most valuable entities here in letting people know how this could impact you. Um, and we'll try to facilitate that. But this is an iterative process, so don't hesitate. We'll be posting materials, but also don't hesitate to contact us if you have additional questions or insights is what we're really looking for. So thank you very much. All right. So again, thank you all for joining us and um, we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Take care.